Deidre Nate's sacral occipital category, he talks about this technique and there is a technique to identify how bad the systems are. In particular, we talk about the respiratory system. So the severity of it. So we use bilateral scales uh, and we evaluate this pump, the respiratory pump. Uh, essentially, we'll have one foot on one scale and the other foot on the other scale and they'll be standing looking straight ahead. And as they breathe, you'll take several minutes to watch the numbers on the scale change. And it, it, with an acute issue of respiratory dysfunction, you'll see that the numbers uh, will, s will gravitate more, hopefully, to uh, zero to five. And if it's, uh, if it's a situation where it's very cute and it's changeable, there'll be a less than five discrepancy. And if it's not, and it's a more persistent slash chronic dysfunction, in other words, they've had it for a long time, they've had it since childhood, they've, they've had it since their back pain 15 years ago, then you might see the numbers gravitate higher than plus five on one side, um, which essentially means that this person, as they gravitate forward and backwards, they have to create their own respiratory pump because their pump is dysfunctional by way of the distortions in the joint complexes being locked down. And this mechanism, you know, is the diaphragm, the transverse abdominis and the pel pelvic floor that are super important to creating this stability and creating this postural alignment and creating this balance. So initially the sway, um, is, is alleviated and they, they basically, the load is taken off the joint complexes from zero to five. And, and once they get to the five plus, we look at the poundage difference. And over time, if it continues to stay in dysfunction, you might see that forward and backward turn into a lateral um, shift. Because like I said, if somebody's not breathing correctly and there's a dysfunction, because the impetus to respir respiration is the diaph diaphragm mobility, if that's been in hindered in some way, diaphragm is, always, is also the impetus to stability. So if they don't have stability and it's for a long period of time, then they've lost the intrinsic system to spinal stiffness, which essentially leads to a spinal issue. And most often, if there's a weight shift laterally, if it's evolved to lateral, then it's going to be a spinal pathology, um, i.e., if you look at category uh, level number three, you'll see the side bend, which is the side bend to the left is basically illustrating a post-lateral bulge to the right, and the body is um, taking the weight off of that disc bulge um, so it alleviates pain. Remember what I always say, the body always moves away from pain. If you're, if you're at the point where you're in pain, then it's done a lot of compensation to get there. So at that point, it's a disc. How respiration has to do with back pain is 100% of the clients with back pain have respiratory dysfunction. So what I basically just told you, that if you have somebody that comes in to, with back pain, you don't look anywhere around the back. You don't, you, you first and foremost start with what the totem pole represents and on the top of the totem pole, if number one is the respiratory mechanism. And if you can get the respiratory, well, first of all, you gotta get them out of pain. But once you can alleviate the pain, the first thing you gotta do is initiate proper diaphragmatic breathing to mobilize that diaphragm so that they can create stability and so they can get get the cerebral spinal fluid nourishing the, the nerves and the discs to create healing and they'll feel so much better. What we have here is a chart that we teach that basically uh, illustrates breathing with moving and uh, the correct breathing patterns with movement. Once you've alleviated uh, someone's pain and you put them in orthopedic alignment, then you can start exercising them and teaching them to move properly with breath. Now, know that there, this is a faulty engram that's been produced. So uh, initially when we start to move, to create a, a, a correct 
uh, engram in the body, it takes about three to 500 um, repetitions. But once we've been in pain and we compensate, we've got all these faulty patterns. And so it's gonna take a good four to six weeks in the gym to rewrite these faulty patterns. And, it's, uh, and that qualifies about 3,500 to 5,000 repet repetitions to override this. So people need to learn the right way to move with breathe. If you don't breathe correctly with movement, there will be stress in the joint complexes and you can actually feel it. Like I'll give you a great example. If you stand in alignment, you can be seated while you're doing this, but you take your um, hands down to your side and you inhale, bringing your arms all the way up to your ears. And then you exhale with your arms going down. Now what I want you to do is inhale first before movement of arms. And then as you raise your arms, exhale. So you can feel the shoulder lock up right about there. So it doesn't feel comfortable when you breathe opposite of what your body um, moves in with that particular breath. So the spine's driven by the breath. Shoulder flexion is coupled with, um, shoulder flexion is coupled with extension of the spine. Not so many people know the right way to breathe. So it's important that we go through this. If you don't breathe correctly with movement, then there will be stress in the joint complexes and you can actually feel it. So the spine drives the breath. Uh, f for instance, if we go up in here to the chart and, um, in the green area where it illustrates specific spinal movements, upon inhalation, we will have axial extension. And with axial extension, we have lengthening or increase spinal stiffness. And when the spine goes into exhalation, the spine flexes and it shortens and it decreases its ability for stability. And if we move then onto our upper extremities as we're going into movements, um, we would couple inhalation with flexion. We would couple inhalation with abduction and horizontal abduction, supination and scapular retraction. And so as the upper extremity uh, goes into extension, we exhale. As we go into adduction, we exhale. Uh, when we are in horizontal adduction, we would exhale. And pronation and scapular protraction is exhalation. And then the last coupling would be the lower extremities. The abdominals are stabilizers that serve respiratory function first. Uh, yes, so the diaphragm first is a respiratory muscle and then it serves if and when needed as a stabilizer. If you don't use stabilization to do a loaded squat, can you see that if you were to go into the eccentric phase of the squat that you would normally exhale, which would take your spine basically into flexion but with the load, this would cause a serious problem. So less than 60%, we talked about 1RM. Um, if the weight is less than 60% uh, of your particular 1RM, it switches to the diaphragm and turns into the stabilization breath, which causes a valsalva maneuver, locks down the diaphragm, act activates the transversus, and the breath through the um, most difficult part of the exercise range of motion. So it stabilizes, it stabilizes your spine in the transverse plane. This is where stabilizing is critical and more critical over breathing. Because if you didn't switch over to the function of uh, stabilization breath and stabilize that spine under loads, you could potentially have a spinal problem, a spinal issue, a, a disc herniation, a disc bolt, which again, your body does not want that. It does not want to be in pain. So it, in a normal, healthy, functioning body, it will switch over automatically. But we're not all that healthy and we, and we don't all have that ability to do that. So 
we have to go into the gym and retrain these things. So inhalation that charges the extensor muscles to stabilize your body as you go through the point of least mechanical efficiency and um, set your core with every repetition. So this requires the stiffening of the system so that once you inhale diaphragmatically, then you activate the transversus with an eccentric contraction and it causes hoop tension within the transversus and the pubic coccyx um, gis, and this causes pressure. Um, so now you're, you've got a, a pressure in the lung cavity, pressure in the abdominal cavity, and the stiffening of the spine cre creates a nice, strong eccentric and concentric movement pattern with, with loads. So the question I always get from people is, why, why, is, the, why is the body more efficient and um, stronger eccentrically? Eh, essentially, if you do, w when you do work eccentrically, it's uh, 30 to 40% stronger because uh, it's less motor units firing within the con eccentric contraction. So that, that pressurizes, all that pressurizes the abdominal cavity, which gives you air pressure um, to minimize any kind of injury to the spine. Now in the gym, some people would use uh, a weight belt, and I've seen people use weight belt whenever they get in situations where they're lifting heavy loads. And so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, why that doesn't serve you. If you think about uh, putting on a weight belt, or if you've, I know I have at some point in my early 20s did use weight belts for weight training because I was told I could lift a lot heavier weights with um, a weight belt if I used it. But essentially think about this. If you cinching up a weight belt, A, yes, it does reduce your range of motion, um, which some people do need that. But the problem is, 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 is the, the weight belt uh, initiates the men's theory, which that if as soon as something is attached to the body, then the body only turns on what it needs to to ultimately save energy. And so um, when the weight belt's clamping down the transversus, the transversus says, oh, I don't need to work as hard. Uh, secondly, when you're cinching down that weight belt, what are you doing to the abdominal cavity? Basically, you're uh, constricting it. So can you do a diaphragmatic breath if you're supposed to expand the abdominal wall? No, it can't happen. So that right there creates tremendous amount of dysfunction in the, in the body because uh, it teaches you to improperly breathe from that point on. And uh, that doesn't serve for a diaphragmatic stable body. Um, secondly, uh, when you um, ultimately take the, the transversus, you can't push the belly out and create stability because the only way the transversus with the fibers running in the transverse plane will turn on is if those fibers shorten and that is by way of the belly button pulling in towards the spine. So just to physically go through what I just said, um, when you're doing a stabilization breath, and you're going to do a movement pattern, i.e. a squat that has a load, uh, essentially more than 60%, you're gonna inhale, big belly, and then draw in your transverse abdominal, so it will go out and then come in, and it'll charge the abdominal and the lung cavity to stabilize you in that transversus plane. You'll go down in your eccentric contraction, and then as you come up and you find that sticking point, hardest point in that movement coming up, that's will you exhale through pursed lips, tongue on the roof of the mouth um, to complete the, the repetition and the um, reps of that squat pattern. So the question is, is should I use a weight belt? Well, it depends on if you truly believe that um, the weight belt represents doing heavy lifts and won't disrupt the respiratory mechanism. We talked about how if we have four rounded shoulders, collapsed diaphragm, dysfunctional breathing, all that locks down the rib cage and it doesn't allow it to do its lateral movement, yes. So one of the things as we start 
repairing and mobilizing the diaphragm so that we can breathe pro properly. Another one of, the, one of the aspects of rehab that we'll wanna do is we'll, we'll start doing mobilization exercise is to make sure that we can create lateral movement. Now, essentially doing breath work will help that, but there's always more that we can do. So you'll see here, we have an individual that is going into extension of the Swiss ball. So she's creating stretch, what on that tight muscle that I told you locks it down. So the rectus abdominis, but what's really beautiful about that exercise is it puts um, everything in the abdominal on stretch. And at the same time, it does the ribs. So as you're going to an extension, hold that position about 60 seconds and then add a deep diaphragmatic breath to it. Mm, you can really feel the sense of compression or how tight the ribs are and the intercostals between those ribs are um, to the degree you breathe deeply into extension and it mobilizes it very quickly. I would also add to that um, particular exercise, a uh, Swiss ball oblique stretch. That will also do the same thing in driving the intention into the lateral aspect of your ribs with big breath as you go into that great stretch. And then also this slide represents uh, the Feldenkrais movement of um, head, neck um, rotation within the cervical and the thoracic, which is essentially needed for the enablement of mobilization of the rib cage. Okay, so this is an enormous amount of extension here in this tennis player, holy smokes. Let's just hope that he has a breathing mechanism that works because if he's doing that much extension on uh, that tennis swing, if he isn't able to um, extend through that spine, where do you think the compensation is going to happen? Well, it would be the shoulder for sure. He would have an injury there because when you, when you go into shoulder flexion, so once you get to about 140 degrees of shoulder flexion, in order to go from 140 to 180, that is all spinal extension. If your spine's locked down due to most likely a respiratory issue or, uh, um, or instability, then the, then the chances of you being able to do that comfortably without any kind of compensation is rare. Also, when you think about as, as it relates to tennis and going into rotation, so tennis is a lot of rotation. And so we talked about ribs being locked down, which we talked about stuck thoracic spine. And so the, the thoracic spine extends, um, you know, th essentially 30 to 35 degrees, but it rotates 30 to 50. And so if you've got a stuck thoracic spine, it's not going to rotate 30 to 50 degrees. And therefore the compensation will happen in lumbar and that will be the driver of rotation, which the lumbar should only rotate between three to 18 degrees. Um, and ultimately if that takes, uh, takes hold every time you play, more than like you're gonna have a, a set hypertrophy, which is gonna cause a trem tremendous amount of localized pain within the facet region because of compensation, okay? Because the thoracic is locked up, because you can't twist through your thoracic spine, because you're um, uh, essentially you've lost stability, because you don't have the breathing mechanism, because you don't have a diaphragm that's mobilized. All of that we just talked about from breathing, okay? So one thing that's uh, a great movement pattern to do that's subtle and healthy for the body to not push it too far into compensation, but also try to mobilize is swimming. So alternate single arm pulling activates and creates reciprocal, um, reciprocal tensions on either side of the spine, um, which induces a functional scoliosis, which is good because it pumps and stimulates the body's normal pathways. Here uh, we have Paul doing a wood chop movement that is utilizing his respiratory system with exhalation on the flexion of this particular exercise. Uh, 
and then as he returns the cable handle to the anchor up top, he would essentially be going into inhalation because the spine is going into extension. Um, when your exercise is use like, utilizing correct breathing patterns and movements, your body gets energized and it gets harmonized. Movement is essential to the pumps to clean and nourish it. Um, we were meant to move, um, obviously, more than we do today. And so continuing on with this respiratory system, if you're going to lift heavy weights and avoid back pain, it'd be very important to follow the physiology of how the breath, how to breathe correctly during movements and to activate your own personal weight belt by activating your own intrinsic system via breath with IE stabilization breath. So the exercise response here would be based off of what are the client's needs versus the objectives and take steps into, obviously, we create objectives to move towards what their needs are. Um, intensity magnifies imbalance. So if obviously you, we see Paul doing heavy lifting, approximately 497 pound deadlift here. If he had dysfunctions or compensation patterns for him to do this much intensity would compound and magnify the amount of uh, distortion and compensation within his body. Now, with this particular lift, obviously he would be doing a stabilization breath versus respiratory. Um, so if a person doesn't breathe right or correctly, it's sort of a bad idea to, to take on heavy lifting, I think, at, at that point, which would be phase three type exercises. So we would communicate first to the client, the objective, educate what the issue is, tell them how you're going to make them better, and then the path to that, which would mean taking them out of loads, out of phase three type exercises, and put them in um, movement patterns with breath that are below the 60% 1RM. And you know, we would do this for about, depending on the level of the individual and dysfunction, I would say maybe four weeks. And I would always, always, always recommend checking back in with the breath because so many things in life can shut down the respiratory apparatus, i.e. chronic stress, fear, digestion issues, and proper ergonomics, all those things um, can happen on a daily basis that could regress or put that person back into an old pattern again. Not everyone's gonna change their life the next day if they have a very stressful job or they're dealing with stressful relationships. So it's always really important as a practitioner that we're always keeping an eye on these things on a, on a regular basis as they're communicating to you, watch their breath pattern, watch how how fast it is always in their, their movements. We're encouraging and reminding them of the proper breath pattern as we hear them breathe during the movements.